Hey everybody, it's Ben Master Medics back here to go over this week's case study. As a reminder, you can start your free three-day trial just by going to mastermedics.com. So let's get into this week's case study. You were dispatched to an 11-year-old with difficulty in breathing. The patient's found sitting on the edge of the couch in a tripod position, having some very short sentence dyspnea. The patient also has a semi-frequent, non-productive, just a very dry cough. Their skin is pink, warm, dry, and they have some mild cyanosis to the lips. Family tells you that the patient has been using their inhaler as prescribed, but with no success. As you start to oscillate over the lung fields, you do not hear any air movement bilaterally. Blood pressure is 96 over 58, heart rate of 122, and the patient's found to be hypoxic at 88% on room air with a blood glucose that is within normal limits. So with this information, the presentation of the patient, what type of differential diagnosis or diagnoses did you come up with? What additional assessments would you like to perform to aid in this differential diagnosis? And with each diagnosis, what was your treatment plan? So let's start with an airway review. The way that we get air into our body to do overall gas exchange, overall ventilation, is that diaphragm pulls down, flattens out, flexes its big muscles to create a system of negative pressure inside the body. So as it pulls down, it pulls the air through our nose, through our mouth, you know, through our nasopharynx, oropharynx, and down into our lungs. So that is a active process. And with that, that negative pressure being created inflates the lungs, creates a higher pressure system within the lungs than it is on the outside. So then for us to exhale is a passive process. That diaphragm just relaxes, so that high pressure that's created within the lungs just goes to the outside to that area of lower pressure than what was on the inside. Then once it goes through the bronchi, down into the bronchioles, eventually gets down into the alveoli. So with all this surface area of the alveoli is where our gas exchange and our overall cellular respiration occurs. With the oxygen and the CO2 exchanging places through diffusion, so the oxygen comes in, hops on the hemoglobin, as CO2 is offloading the hemoglobin for us to exhale through that passive process. But in the instances of asthmatics, such as in this case study, here's where the issue lies. So if you look here at my great, great, great illustration that I drew, the diaphragm flattens out, comes through the trach, bifurcation through the bronchioles, good air volume going into the right lung, good air volume going into the left lung. Now, one thing that is a little bit off in my illustration is that the right main brain stem is angled out pretty well, more of a straighter down angle, whereas the left one has a greater arch out to the left side. And actually the left side is just a little bit smaller than the right side. But what happens with our asthmatics is bronchoconstriction in these areas. So we go from a system of having a good open freeway to now it's a really tight back country road. And the issue is when the diaphragm pulls down, it can pull the air through that tight passageway, but now everything becomes congested and it's harder for that air to escape through those really narrow bronchioles. So we end up having some hyperinflated lungs. As you can see, my sweet hash marks here outlining that hyperinflated lung. So that's why a lot of the times those asthmatics have that dry, non-productive cough because the air is trapped inside. So their body's coughing, trying to expel some of that built up stagnant air. So if we can think about the way that we inhale and when they're getting to those points where their diaphragm is getting wore out, the air trapping is increasing. You know, if we think about air going all the way down as it should normally. So we always have a little bit of residual volume at the base of our lungs from just overall residual volume and expiratory residual volume. So really no matter as hard as we try to exhale, there's always a little bit of air left in our lungs. But then if we can think of it as with that air trapping, that's, you know, a little bit of early bronchoconstriction, air gets down into here to do all the gas exchange. Then as more bronchoconstriction occurs, air trapping becomes worse. We only may be doing air exchange with this amount of volume instead of our regular overall tidal volume. So then with that, as the level of air exchange decreases, our level of CO2 increases, worsening the states of respiratory acidosis. 
So a little bit of pathophys in these asthmatic patients. So overall, they kind of have a hypersensitivity or like a, a hyper responsiveness to some type of exposure, allergen, or stimulant that is causing all this from their uh, immunological responses. Whether that's dust, insects, animals, flowers, cold air, cigarette smoke, whatever it may be, there's some type of allergen that is triggering a response in our immune system to cause a hyperreactiveness or hypersensitivity to that immunological response. Okay, so our immunoglobin E, you know, part of um, our overall immune system, it goes and it binds into our mast cells, on those white blood cells, to go in and start working. So whenever our, the allergen that has come into our body gets exposed to that mast cell, it kind of goes and can almost like, you think about the jagged edge allergen, it pops that cell and it starts to break down. And then a lot of cytokines get released from that breakdown. And then ultimately, as I like to say, we produce the three stooges. So out of that breakdown comes histamine, prostaglandin, and leukotrienes. Okay, so those big three stooges are all responsible for causing that inflammation, the bronchoconstriction, and overall uh, smooth muscle irritability within those bronchospasms. So as our normal bronchial would lie here of that smooth muscle inside and good open passageways, what happens is the three stooges get in and then they start attacking that smooth muscle or not start attacking, but it's causing a reaction of that smooth muscle to become inflamed, bronchoconstricted, and really irritated. And with that, mucus production occurs in there as well as a byproduct to those three issues occurring. So the three stooges go in, we got bronchoconstriction, inflammation, and smooth muscle overall irritability. So with treatment pathways, we're gonna start with what I like to call the short-term goals. With this, we're gonna be utilizing medications or devices that have a really quick onset to be getting in to stabilize that patient as quickly as possible. So it's always gonna begin with oxygen in all of our respiratory patients. To prevent hypoxia from getting worse, to prevent that respiratory acidosis and CO2 accumulation from getting worse, to try to stabilize them quickly. And then we're gonna kick into are nebulizing some beta-2 agonists, such as albuterol and atrovent. And then we think about in the scenario of using that meter dose inhaler that they weren't able to get it to work because with that negative pressure being occurred from a diaphragm pulling down, that little bit of medications going in, with that little bit of actual air exchange that's happening, there's just not enough pull to get the medication down into the really small bronchioles that could ultimately be completely constricted closed. So with that nebulizer treatment, what we can do is put CPAP in it if they're at the point where that diaphragm's not strong enough to be pulling it down in. So we do the inline neb and we use that CPAP just to help give that diaphragm just a little bit of extra oomph and boost that it needs to be creating that negative pressure to pull down. Just the same analogy of giving somebody a bench or a spot whenever they're doing a bench in the gym, just a couple fingers will help them be able to get that press in long ways. The one thing to mention is we need to be cautious and really try to avoid ventilating that patient since they already have that air trapping issue and we don't want to cause a lot more overventilation or hypervolumization hyper of their lungs worsening that air trapping. And then once we went through the quick stabilization things with you know, our beta agonist, quick short-term things, then we're looking at the long-term things. Once we've started those short-term goals that their onset is pretty quick, but their duration of action isn't quite as long. Then we go with something like our corticosteroids, where their onset of action isn't quick, so we get those started while the beta-2 agonists and whatnot are working. So we got different options of, you know, solumedrol, dexamethasone, there's a buku amounts of different corticosteroids that are out there. So the way that they will work is when those mast cells break down, a lot of the responses, um, the steroids go in and help block all those inflammatory and side products that are occurring from the mast cells breakdowns and the cytokine breakdowns. So the steroids prevent these issues here from reducing inflammation, all these things from reoccurring. So with the steroids and even getting the mag sulfate help with these big three here of inflammation, stopping bronchoconstriction and slowing or halting that hyperreactiveness. And then the way that the mag sulfate will help these out is 
in those breakdowns, there's also a large production of calcium uptake into that smooth muscle of the bronchioles. And with that smooth muscle pickup of that calcium, it makes them very sensitive and very reactive to bronchoconstriction. So mag sulfate ultimately blocks that process. So it's preventing that smooth muscle from uptaking that calcium to make those bronchioles really easily irritated and irritable from those immunological responses. Okay, so as a refresher for those asthmatics, what we need to focus on is doing really good quick onsets of medications that have a quick onset of action of, you know, our oxygen, our beta-2 agonists, and then going into our long-term care goals of, you know, giving them the smooth muscle um, issues, steroids, mag sulfate, a variety of things to, that are going to work on a longer-term goal to prevent that inflammation and bronchoconstriction from reoccurring or overall worsening. So thank you all for tuning in. I'll catch you all on the next one. Take care.